Hello everyone, welcome back to Engineering Physics Wave Mechanics. Now in this video, we're going to be comparing simple harmonic motion to uniform circular motion and show how the two are related and do an alternative derivation for the displacement of a simple harmonic oscillator. So to start, let's start off by defining a unit circle for the uniform circular motion. Actually, it doesn't have to be a unit circle, it just could be any circle. And so let's assume now that we have a point P on this circle. So we call this arrow, this vector from uh, the origin to this point P, a phasor. And a phasor, uh, basically spelled like this, F-P-H-A-S-O-R, is a rotating vector that just models uh, different things like the displacement, the velocity, or the acceleration, for instance. And that's what we're going to be doing in this video. So this phasor is going to move some angle. And this phasor, when it moves, is going to go to a point Q. So we need to model the displacement from P to Q. So let me put some measurements down. So the initial angle that the phasor makes at the point P is called the initial phase phi. And that's the exact same initial phase that we've defined in our previous videos. And so this is the initial angle of the circular motion. And so when it moves, it goes through another angle beta. And that beta uh, traces out an arc length from P to Q. And we say that, oh, sorry, just give me a quick second. I'm going to take out that word phasor because it's blocking that way. Uh, sorry, just give me a second. So, yeah. So the arc length that we measure is obviously R theta, but the theta between P and Q is obviously beta. So we're going to say that the arc length from P to Q, or the distance covered from P to Q by the arc length, is equal to R beta. And of course, R is just going to be the radius, so the length of one of these phasors. It's the same phasor, actually. So it's going to be equal to R beta, which is also equal to VT. And V is the tangential speed along the curve, which is assumed to be a constant, because we are dealing with uniform circular motion, so we're not accelerating around the circle. And of course, time is just uh, the T variable right there. So the total angle beta and phi make the total angle theta. And theta is what we call the uh, complete phase of the oscillator. So we define theta as just being beta plus phi. And if we sub in now, we for beta is equal to vt over r, we get that theta is equal to vt over r plus phi. However, if you've studied um, angular mechanics or rotational mechanics, however you'd like to call it, you would know that omega is equal to vt over r. And recall, omega is simply just the angular speed. So how much, how many radians is, are changing, or how many radians are we going through per second, right? So that's d theta dt if we're looking from the calculus point of view. So because of that, uh, if we compare translational and rotational quantities, we get that omega is equal to the tangential speed, which is vt over r. Same thing with s equals r theta. So you always multiply um, the radius times the angular quantity to get the translational quantity. And so what we, like I mentioned, the entire uh, theta equals omega t plus phi is the phase of an oscillator where phi is the initial phase. And this is where we get the, um, the phase inside the cosine for the uh, displacement function. And so, yeah, this is the simple proof for uh, SHM and UCM. However, this can only work if the radius is equal to the amplitude from SHM. So let's move on and define another uh, circle now for UCM. So it's the same case here. We're going to have a phasor from a 0 to P. And the angle this time is now theta. So I'm assuming here that theta is omega t plus phi already. So I'm just, I'll just write that down, actually. So I'm assuming that this theta is equal to omega t plus phi that we've defined earlier. So we could assume that, for example, there might have been a point um, R, for instance, here originally, where the P is now the next point. So theta is the total phase angle. And so let's continue on. So like I mentioned, in order to compare SHM and UCM, we have to assume that the radius or the length of this phasor from a uniform circular motion is equal to the amplitude from simple harmonic motion. And we also have to assume that the angular speed, i.e. d theta dt, how many radians we're going through per second, is equal to the natural angular frequency from um, simple harmonic motion. And if we do that, then we can say that, of course, r is equal to a, and the displacement uh, along the x direction, of course, is x. So what we can do is we can draw a line downwards from the point p and take the, this projection onto the x-axis of the phasor. And, of course, uh, of, uh, the angular speed is going to be the um, angular frequency. So we're moving uh, 
through an angle theta in uh, per with the speed of omega equals omega n. And so if we do that, we get that x is equal to r cos omega t plus phi. And because of then so x is the projection of the phasor at p down to the x axis, right? Because x is equal to a cos theta, but th uh, sorry, but theta is defined as omega t plus phi. And if we consider r to be a, then we get a cos omega n t plus phi. And so here we are, SHM and UCM correlate. And so what we can take away from this is that from uniform circular motion, if we have the r is equal to a and omega is equal to the natural angular frequency, we can say that uh, uh, simple harmonic motion is the projection of uniform circular motion onto a line. And in this case, you, we usually project it onto the x-axis. So we don't use the y projection. We only use the x projection. So yeah, moving on. We also have y equals r sine omega t plus phi. But what does this actually mean? Now, this is the y projection. So this pro uh, predicts how a vertical system would move. However, this isn't actually what we use for our um, uh, sorry our simple harmonic motion equations and because we use, we don't do this uh, we don't do this because they're pi out of 2 out of phase with the x displacement so if you use the trig identity sine theta is equal to cos pi over 2 minus theta we get a sine omega nt plus phi which is also equal to a cos omega nt plus phi minus pi over 2 so like i you could factor out a negative here and get this answer because if you factor out a negative in the argument of the cosine you get theta uh, negative theta, no sorry, you get theta minus pi over 2, but because of the negative factor out, the cosine consumes that negative and returns the same positive argument. So that's how we got this. So what this means is that the, sign, the y projection is pi out of 2 out of phase with the x projection. However, for uh, simple harmonic motion, we always model our equations using the x displacement. So yeah, now let me move on to the next page. So before going on to the next page or the next part of the video, I'd actually just like to show you these two GIFs, or, and yes, they are pronounced GIFs, I did search it up. These two GIFs that represent sort of the motion that we've been looking at with these phasors. So as you can see on the bottom GIF, um, the vertical uh, motion of a simple harmonic oscillator to the right can be modeled by the vertical displacement perfectly well if they're in sync. And this is assuming that r is equal to a and that omega, the angular speed, is equal to the natural angular frequency of the oscillator. So you can see the vertical displacements matching perfectly. But of course, we always model our um, simple harmonic motion with x displacements. And you can see that at the top. Because usually when we look at um, our x displacement, we're assuming that the simple harmonic oscillator starts from a positive or negative amplitude, amplitude position. And that's why we start modeling with x instead of y, because y starts at zero, right? So now let's actually move on to the second part of the video. So for the second half of this video, I'm basically going to con uh, confirm some more equations. Like, for instance, I'm going to confirm that omega, the natural angular frequency, is indeed equal to uh, the K effective spring constant over m. However, we're only going to deal with one spring constant, so we're going to prove that it's equal to the square root of k over m. So to start, let's define three circles in uniform circular motion, and let's define some phasors. So I've defined a position, velocity, and acceleration um, uniform circular graph with each of their own phasors. So of course, we already defined this vector phasor x uh, uh, point p with uh, phase theta. And this, of course, we know that r is equal to a, and we're assuming that it's moving counterclockwise. So if we look at the velocity at this point p, we know that the velocity in, and of course, um, not rotational mechanics, but translational me uh, mechanics, that is, the velocity always acts tangentially to the circle. So that's why we have v acting tangentially here, and we have theta uh, being down here, which makes it's just the same angle from the position graph, uh, position circle, sorry, and the theta is but the z rule theta is also up here, and theta will also be up here. So that'll come in handy when we start doing our derivations. And we know from ex the our acceleration graph, we know that if you study uniform circular motion, that we always have a normal acceleration acting inwards towards the center of the circle. And if you've studied more um, complex uniform circular motion, actually just circular motion in general, then you know that we might you might have an ex uh, a tangential acceleration. However, we don't have a tangential acceleration here, so we have at is equal to zero simply because we are dealing with the uniform circular motion, right? So v won't be changing. 
I mean, of course, the velocity will be changing because the direction of the vector changes, but the magnitude of the, sp the magnitude, i.e., the speed, will not change around the circle, and that's why we have a constant angular speed as well. And so, yeah, let's work with our equations now, or our graphs now. So let's define the x projection again. So we defined the x projection to be a cos theta, right? So that's how we got a cos omega n t plus phi, and in the velocity, uh, uh, sorry, phase or graph or circle, that is, we have vx as being the x projection of the velocity onto the x-axis as being the vector v at p uh, sine theta, right? Because sine theta is the opposite, so we define this blue vector arrow right here to be the x projection of the velocity because we're trying to project everything onto the x-axis right now. And in for terms of acceleration, of course, we can project that as well. So we have the acceleration in the x-direction as being a at acceleration at p, the vector cosine of theta. And I'm going to redefine these a little bit differently now. So I'm going to say, I'm going to take out the vector arrow, and I'm going to just uh, look at um, the magnitude, basically. So I'm going to say that Vx, uh, let's see here. Yeah, actually, no, sorry, the uh, vector is still the same, but I've taken, uh, for example, Vp here and Ap, I've taken these and broken them down into scalars. And the reason I've done that is, uh, the way I've done that is by taking out this negative, because I know they're pointing in the negative direction. So I've, I'm, uh, of course, I'm going to, just to emphasize that this is the negative x, this is positive x. And because of that, I've defined vx, the vector vx, as being negative vp sine theta, and the vector ax as being negative ap cos theta. And from here, we can now look at some relationships. So we know that the vector ax is the x projection of the vector a onto the x axis. However, we also know that ap. Oh, sorry, not the vector AP, just the scalar AP is V squared over uh, the radius. And we know that the radius length is A. So I'm just going to write this down. Um, we know that, for example, the centripetal force, for instance, is MV squared over R, right? But AC, which is a centripetal force uh, or center-seeking acceleration, is V squared over R. So that's where we get this V squared over A from. So yeah, we get negative V squared over A cosine theta is equal to negative omega A squared over A because V is equal to omega A, right? Remember we defined, or I showed you, not showed you, I just mentioned that omega equals V T over R. So if you just multiply both sides by R, right, you get V is equal to omega A. And because of that, uh, a squared up top cancels out with the a, so you leave, it leaves one a up top. And we get uh, that it, ax, the vector ax is going to be equal to negative omega squared a cosine of theta, which is equal to negative omega squared, squared x, because this is x. And now, of course, we have this in a form that we already know of. So if we compare this now with a is equal to negative k over mx, we get simply that if we take ax being the horizontal projection that represents the simple harmonic motion along the x-axis, then we can easily compare this with the simple harmonic motion along the x-axis that we already know of with a. And because of that, we get that omega, the natural angular frequency, must be equal to the square root of k over m. So hopefully I've kind of convinced you that this is indeed true. I know I kind of brought it up on the spot in our derivation video, but hopefully you are convinced that this is indeed true. So now let's move on to an example. So here's an example from Professor Roger Moore's textbook, and Professor Roger Moore is a professor that teaches uh, the course Phys 130 at the University of Alberta, which is uh, identical to um, engineering physics wave mechanics that we have going on here. So to start, let's actually try and understand what this question is. So two identical springs are hung vertically next to each other, and this the first spring has a mass m attached to it, and the second spring has a mass of 2m attached to it. Both masses are pulled down from their equilibrium positions and released at rest at exactly the same time. What is the magnitude of the phase difference between the displacement of the two masses after the first mass has reached its equilibrium position for the first time? So let's actually model this. So I'm going to draw one spring over here. And we're going to say this is mass M. So this is the case. This is spring one. And here we're going to have spring two. So... Well, let's say it's pulled down further, because of course the spring constant, actually the spring constant is the same. Um, actually, yeah. Let's say they're pulled down the same amount. Why not? But this, of course, has a mass 2m, so this will affect the angular frequency, the period, and the frequency. So let's try and model this. We know that the phase of both of these oscillators are given by angles. So we have theta 1 is equal to omega 1t 
plus phi 1, and theta 2 is equal to omega 2t plus phi 2. So first, let's try and solve for what phi 1 and phi 2 are. So we know that both masses are pulled down from their equilibrium positions and released at rest. So that means that v naught equals 0, and we have x naught is equal to a, which is the maximum, right? Because since we have 0 initial speed, the pull down length will be the maximum length. And so in this case, we also have v naught equals 0, and x naught is equal to a. Now it doesn't matter, we assumed that both of these have the same amplitude, however that doesn't have to necessarily be true. So let's go with this and let's say, let's for, try and find the initial phase angle. So we know that the initial phase angle phi is equal uh, to inverse tangent of negative v naught over x naught omega n. However if v naught is zero, then that means the inverse tangent is of, is of zero. So tan negative one, zero, which equals zero. So perfect. I mean, we didn't define phi one or phi two for this equation, but because v naught is zero in both cases, that means phi one and phi two must be equal to zero. So really, theta one is really equal to just omega one t, and theta two is equal to omega two t. So now let's try and sub in for omega one and omega two. So theta one is equal to omega one t, but by the definition of omega in terms of the spring constant and the mass, we get that theta one is equal to the square root of k over m t. Oh, sorry, I forgot the equal sign. And theta two is equal to omega two t, which is equal to root k over two m t. However, we can actually bring out that one over root two outside so that we get uh, one over root two root k over m t. However, root k over mt is what we just defined to be theta 1. So this means that omega uh, theta 2 is equal to theta 1 over root 2. So here we have something to work with now. And what the question is asking is, what is the magnitude of the phase difference between the displacement of the two masses after the first mass has reached its equilibrium position for the first time? And we know that the equilibrium position happens at pi over uh, a phase angle of pi over 2 and the reason we know this is because we start off from the very bottom of the motion right so let me say that the equilibrium position for instance is here right so of course we're at the most negative position here so it's going to go up and this is going to cover pi over 2 on that unit circle and so when we go back up this will be another pi over 2 but then when we come back down, this will be another pi over 2, and then another pi over 2. And this is how we get our phase of total, a total phase of 2 pi. And then the cycle repeats itself, right? So this is why we know that the phi, or, sorry, that the phase will be pi over 2 when we reach equilibrium. And the question says, is, is asking, what is the magnitude of the phase difference between the displacement of the two masses after the first mass has reached its equilibrium position for the first time? So that means theta 1 will have to be equal to pi over 2. So that means that, that at that point, that theta 2 will be equal to pi over 2 over root 2, which is equal to pi over 2 root 2. So all we have to do now is just take the absolute difference between those, these two phase angles. So we can say that the absolute value of theta 2 minus theta 1 is equal to pi over 2 root 2 minus, sorry, just give me a second, pi over 2 root 2 minus uh, pi over 2. So I'm now going to multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by root 2 over root 2 such that we can now combine the two fractions to make it pi minus root 2 pi all over 2 root 2. And so, actually, sorry, let me kind of make that pi nicer. Nah, I just made a mess here. But of course, I'm just going to factor out this pi. So we get pi 1 minus, oh, sorry, pi minus, sorry, 1 minus root 2 over 2 root 2. However, 1 minus root 2 is actually negative because root 2 is approximately 1.40 something, I believe, or 1.41 something. So, you actually have to flip this around because we're looking for the absolute value. So, this will now become, let's see here, pi root 2 minus 1 over 2 root 2. And there you go. That is the final answer. So, let's try and actually make sense of this. So, in our second spring system, we have a mass of 2m. And we know that for any physical system, if we increase the mass, we're technically increasing the inertia as well. And of course, inertia is the resistance to acceleration, right? It's a property of a mass in, in terms of physics. So when we're talking about uh, the mass being, uh, when we're talking about greater inertia, we're talking about the period now becoming longer. 
So let's actually try and look at this, right? So we have t is equal to 2 pi over omega if we arrange, rearrange the equation on the right because omega is equal to 2 pi over t. So omega 2, uh, or the second angular frequency of the second system, or sorry, the second angular frequency representing the second system is the square root of k over 2m. But and so because of the 2m, the sorry, omega 2 will now become smaller than just what omega 1 is, right? Because this 2 uh, provides a factor that kind of decreases it by 1 over root 2, right? So because of that, um, what we're going to have is we're going to have omega 2 being smaller than omega 1. And when we plug in 2 pi over omega 2, we're going to get a value greater than the initial period. So this, uh, let's see, let me just write this down. So T1 of the first system is going to be greater. Oh, no, sorry, not greater. T1 is going to be less than T2. And the reason is, is because T2 is equal to 2 pi over omega 2. But omega 2 is equal to, uh, sorry, omega 2 is smaller than omega 1, which will cause this denominator to be smaller, which will make the period larger. So it takes a longer time for the second system to reach its equilibrium position compared to system 1. So when the system, let me kind of draw it to the left side a little bit. When the first system reaches its equilibrium position, the second system will be somewhere here still. It will be somewhere out here. And this is the phase difference we're looking for, the, dis the difference in where they are in their cycles. And so hopefully you understood that, and I hope you found this video informative. In the next video, we'll be talking about a little bit more about velocity and acceleration, so it'll be a shorter video. And hopefully you guys found this video informative, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.